So the plan today, we're going to talk about pain management. And I was asked to talk about pain management on a budget, um, and I wasn't really sure what that meant. So what I kind of did was my normal pain management talk, but tried to pay attention to what things cost, and also keeping in mind that what things cost for me might be really different than what things cost for you all. So I'll just point out along the way um, some ways that pain management doesn't have to be expensive. Um, the other thing is that this is two talks um, split um, into two hours, and I don't have like a particular end point, so there are going to be some cases more towards the end, so that's like a plug for hour two, um, but we have a break at 9.30, so I'll stop at 9.25, hopefully you guys will have questions, and then we'll have our break and we'll come back wherever we happen to be at 9.45. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is go over some of the basic agents available to us with an eye to what they cost um, and sort of talk about strategies for using them um, in the different realms in which we work. And then we'll talk about cases. And I tried to think about veterinarians who work in spay neuter as well as shelter based veterinarians who might be seeing a broader array of cases. And then in community medicine, a lot of us are seeing um, more cases more typical of like a general practice, so a really broad range of conditions that we might have to treat. But I definitely focus on spay neuter, other types of surgical or acute pain, a little bit on trauma. And then um, one of the things that I think we're seeing is that even though we may not be treating patients chronically in a community med medicine setting very often, um, we are seeing patients that might have chronic pain from other situations going on with them before we meet them. So I think that's important to consider um, as you're working them up and coming up with a plan for them in the shelter. So we'll talk about chronic pain a bit at the end. And then I put in a case that we had recently at Tufts that, um, that really kind of forced us to think about chronic pain a lot in a, sh in a shelter patient. So some of the challenges that we have in our world compared to like my ivory tower existence when I work upstairs is that we often don't have a lot of information about the patient. We're kind of making our best guess based on what we know about the history, but we often don't have that caregiver there giving us you know, all the detailed history about everything that's going on with them. Most of us, and this is certainly true for our community medicine clinics at Tufts, do not have overnight care available, which means that some of the standard protocols, especially for big deal surgeries like orthopedic surgeries or fracture repair, um, we really can't stick them in a cage and put them on a CRI and tell the nurse to turn it up or down. Like that just does not exist in our world. So we have to be kind of innovative and come up with strategies that are going to keep them um, so they're all set, at least until the next day when we see them again. Sometimes we have lots of follow-up. Um, if we're doing community work, maybe the caregivers aren't bringing them back to us. Um, we have to consider that when we send drugs out our door. Where are those drugs going? What is the likelihood that they're going to come back to us? Um, and sometimes we don't get to know what happens to our patients, which can be frustrating. And then we do see a lot of chronic health conditions, and if we are working in a law enforcement type of setting, some of those conditions can be exacerbated by neglect if the animal hasn't gotten regular veterinary care often. Um, the also other challenges for us for doing good pain management in the, our world is just access to the drugs. So we may not be able to afford certain drugs, and I'll point some of those differences out as we go along, or we may not have the ability to prescribe, um, depending on where we're at, if we're in a mobile situation or working overseas. So you always have to keep in mind sort of the pra pragmatic factors of what can I actually get. And because it's pain management on a budget, I was thinking as I wrote this that fundamentally, should the budget really be a challenge that we work around? Like, don't our patients deserve the best care um, that we can provide them? So I am trying to be budget conscious, but ultimately, sometimes we might just have to go advocate for our patient with a budget busting protocol if we really think that's the best thing. So if we just look at our ethics or animal welfare perspective, the budget is probably the last factor that we should be paying attention to. That being said, we all have to stay in business, and certainly in spay neuter, we cost everything down to the nearest penny. So it's, it, I found it really interesting just to think about how much these things actually cost. Pain assessment um, is really, really important. Um, it should be incorporated into your daily physical exams of the patients. If you're doing rounds on patients that you're housing, 
pain assessment should be included. We kind of have this argument between the anesthesiologist and the nutritionist about what's the fifth vital sign. We say it's pain, they say it's nutrition. I don't really care whether you call it the fifth or sixth vital sign, but you should have an assessment uh, right after your TPR of the patient's um, pain level. Particularly for your patients that are post-op, for any of your older animals, um, I think untreated chronic pain in older animals is a big health challenge that we often under um, under recognize. Um, and then if we're if we're seeing neglect or law enforcement cases, that can be really part of putting a strong case together is documenting the pain and why you believe the animal would be suffering or in pain. Really important, especially if you're preparing documents for court to use a standardized um, scoring system. It doesn't really matter which one you use. There's lots of different options for this. So the VAS is just the visual analog score. That's what's most commonly used in people. Um, so that's here basically happy face, sad face. Um, and you can just make a mark. You can use a numerical rating scale, which is just where whatever, 0 to 10, 0 to 6, you just mark a number down. And if it's one or two people consistently doing that, that's been shown to be relatively accurate if you're a trained individual. A simple descriptive scale would be where you give each of these categories. So a good example of that um, is the Colorado pain score, which I know a lot of you are using. So they have that for cats. Um, I call that the sad kitty scale. It kind of has the pictures of the sad kitties at the bottom. We're going for happy kitties at the top. Um, so they have that for cats and dogs. It hasn't been validated through research, but it is increasingly widely used. So it's kind of getting validated by a default. Um, so I like that one because it's got the pictures, it's got the descriptions, and you can get everyone on your team kind of evaluating them the same way. There's a lot of more complicated scores, like one, another commonly used one is the Glasgow score. Um, that's one you'll see more used in a research setting. Um, we love these kind of assessments and research because we can measure them and then we can try to see if they change over time. But I don't find those to be particularly practical for use in a clinical setting. The Colorado is much more um, practical. Um, one of the problems with Glasgow is it incorporates um, levels of sedation. And while, um, while sedation and um, anxiety and pain management kind of go together, they're not the same thing. So when you're talking acute pain, um, that refers to pain um, caused by, mostly we're talking about surgical pain or acute trauma. And the key concepts here that you really want to keep in mind is preventative analgesia, which sometimes you'll hear referred to as preemptive analgesia, which is a little bit of an outdated term. Um, but both of these really mean treating the pain before you cause the injury. So surgery is the best model for that because we are causing the injury, so we know when the timing will be. So we know we need to get our analgesics on, on board before we cause the injury, and that's going to have the best chance of preventing a chronic pain state or um, problems postoperatively. And then the second key concept is multimodal analgesia, and that's using lots of different agents to target different mechanisms for pain so that you get a synergy. You'll get less negative side effects of any one agent, and all together they'll work better. And I'll point out a lot of examples of this as we go along. The good news is that most of your standard spay-neuter protocols are multimodal and are very preventative. So chances are what you're already doing for spay-neuter um, follows along very nicely with these concepts. It's when you go outside of the spay-neuter world that you need to consider, A, is your patient stable enough for this protocol, and B, have I really gone as broad spectrum and as multimodal as I need to for this higher um, level of pain? And then it's really, really important to remember that animals are individuals, and so we need to have a plan for continual assessment and adjustment. And that could be your staff who's checking on the patients, uh, especially if you're doing something a little different than you normally do, telling the staff what to expect and what to be looking for, and also for a pet owner. So if you're discharging animals, which a lot of us are after these surgeries, we really need to tell them what to expect and when to call you. Um, we have big pet peeves as anesthesiologists when people prescribe pain meds give as needed, most pet owners don't really know what that means. So you need to tell them what are signs that they would see that would indicate they should give the medications or not give the medications and have a way for them to call someone for advice if they need it. 
<clears throat> so in spay and neuter, we know an analgesia is absolutely required. The multimodal protocols are the standard of care. And as I already mentioned, many of the drugs that we've always relied on for anesthesia are also part of our analgesic protocol. It's really when we get into the post-op options when we start feeling questioning what we're doing and finding differences between programs and giving ourselves a lot of angst. So we'll talk a little bit about that. This is just a graph um, stolen from the Mayo Clinic to remind us kind of all the places where pain um, is relevant in the body and where the different agents work. So obviously spinal cord and brain, central nervous system is going to be the most important place and a lot of our agents work there like opioids, ketamine, and gabapentin. But also in the periphery, remember that we have opioid receptors and throughout the periphery in places like joints. And wherever you have um, opioid receptors, you also have alpha-2 receptors. And then our local anesthetics, which I'm going to talk about a lot, are the only ones that directly block transmission. So if you do a local block, you have complete anesthesia of the area you're blocking. And that's really effective for acute pain. That's why humans can have so many procedures done under sedation, because they have complete anesthesia and analgesia. And we've underutilized those tools in veterinary medicine because our patients are under anesthesia and they can't yell at us. Um, but the prevention of the transmission transmission is what sets that patient up for a pain-free post-operative period. So even though you can feel your local block wearing off and then you're painful, you're not as painful as you would be if you didn't have the block before. Um, and so I think um, we're increasingly becoming aware that the blocks that we do at surgery are really important in the post-operative period, even if we're using a short-acting drug. So these are kind of our usual suspects that we're all using perioperatively. So you have your opioids, you have ketamine, local anesthetics, alpha-2 agonists, and NSAIDs. So the first thing I wanted to do to respond to my assigned topic was, all right, so what is the cost of these agents that we're using? Um, and so I priced them out at Tufts, and then I priced them out at an unnamed partnering organization um, in, the, in the real world. Um, so you can see it's kind of interesting. So some of the things at Tufts are more expensive, and some of the things in, in the real world are more expensive. Um, and some of that is universities get special pricing, we do volume purchasing, although I will say all of our things were purchased at MWI, which is probably where a lot of you all purchase things too. Um, so hydromorphone at Tufts, it's $175 per mil, and that's for the 2 mg per mil, no, that's for the 10 mg per mil product. Um, in the real world, it's $3.35 a mil, so close. Ketamine at Tufts, $1.04 per mil. In the real world, almost $5 per mil. Lidocaine, I always say, and I'll say this a couple times in this talk, that it's among the least expensive agent. I didn't realize how freaking cheap this stuff was. We're talking pennies per dose. So you cannot ever use budget as an excuse to not use local anesthetics in your practice. Even bupivacaine, which I also priced out, is still under 50 cents per dose. So um, it's 5 cents per mil at Tufts. It's 1 cent per mil. I don't know where these folks are buying it for, but that is wicked cheap. Um, carprofen, it's because at Tufts, they are buying Rimadil. So $6 a mil for the Rimadil. If you can get the generic, it's closer to a dollar per mil. Um, and these, I just pulled orders from 2019. So these are recent prices. So opioids for spay and neuter programs, most of us are using something like hydromorphone or buprenorphine. Some people are using butorphanol. At Tufts, buprenorphine is $19.51 a mil. Yikes. So um, we're using hydromorphone for spay and neuters. Um, and that's because our pharmacist will not buy compounded products. They're very risk averse as far as the compounding regulations. So they're buying straight up traditional formulation from the human side. Um, so yikes. Um, so buprenorphine is one of our favorite drugs in spay and neuter. It potentially provides better analgesia, especially in cats. The duration of action is going to be longer than the hydromorphone, and we feel like it has fewer side effects, particularly for the cat, and we know that we can give it oral transmucosally, so we can get into some of these other surgeries. That can be a handy tip for uh, longer-term pain management. For cats, if we use a higher end of the dose range, 0.02 to 0.03 mg per kg, you're going to get a longer duration of action um, where you can only dose them maybe twice a day. Um, and the big issue is the cost. 
For butorphanol, um, we get sedation and mild analgesia, and most of us feel like it's not enough analgesia for any sort of surgery, although there is some good research that shows that if you combine it with other agents like alpha-2 agonists, which we do, um, you can get pretty good analgesia. So for example, for a pediatric dog neuter, we're using butorphanol and dexmedetomidine, and then they're just getting an NSAID. Um, and so there are situations where that may be enough analgesia so looking at the post-op period, which is where the trouble is, problem with butorphanol is just not really going to last you long enough. Um, problem with buprenorphine, still injectable, um, and then the cost. And then we have tramadol, which kind of we went to because we didn't have other good options. Um, really questioning whether that works as a pain med in the dog right now. So, but in general, for post-op, we should not really be relying on the, the opioids at all. Um, we want to think about reducing our use of narcotics and anything that we can do to use less narcotics. And overall, they're not really appropriate for routine discharge or going home use. So there are going to be situations we get into the non spinor surgeries where we feel like we might want to use some opioids, but it's not really the mainstay of what we're sending home. So for buprenorphine, one of the issues which caused a lot of confusion is the different formulations. So here's the, the Tufts is buying the 0.3 mg per mil product. It comes in these pesky one mil vials, which is wicked annoying, especially if you're doing 80 cats. Um, for a Labrador, that's $35 for one dose of buprenorphine. So that's a budget buster right there for us, right? The compounded buprenorphine that the unnamed partnering organization is using, um, they're buying the 0.6 mg per mil, um, and they're getting a 15 mil bottle. So the cost there is $4 per mil. So that's a lot more economical for us. I couldn't find anybody who orders Cymbidol. Um, anybody order Cymbidol in here? A couple people. Do you guys know the cost of a bottle? Yeah, so no one would tell me the cost so that I could do the math. Um, oh, I should have the caveat that I'm pretty bad at math, so I did my best. But if you find a math error, um, try not to publicly shame me. Um, but at any rate, what they did tell me was that it's about six times more on a MIG per kg basis. So this one, again, lasts 24 hours. So in some private practices where they're giving that as their pre-op for like a dental in a cat, that can be cost effective. But for spay neuter so far, it hasn't, for me, been um, particularly useful because of the cost. The one thing that you're starting to see pop up, I saw an article in DVM360 about this, and there's something on um, the ASG, um, is whether you can use Cymbidol off-label like, as a substitute for other, um, for not, especially if you can't get the buprenorphine you're used to getting. Um, as far as I know, there's zero research around this. It's way, way off-label, but you're finding articles popping up where people are using that concentrated buprenorphine at the regular dose, so then it becomes pretty cost-effective because it's a tiny amount. Um, and so there are, um, Jeff Coe talks a lot about this and has done it in dogs and cats. Um, my colleagues at Tufts were fairly horrified when I brought that to them, so I'm not sure that I've been brave enough to try that yet. Um, but so far, that's out there. And it, we may have to go to that, because the good thing about Cymbidol is it's marketed by Zoeti, so it's a veterinary formulation. So if things on the human side get bad enough that we can't get our compounded buprenorphine, then that may be where we go, because it is at least a veterinary product. So overall, why we're trying to avoid the opioids is because of these side effects. So we commonly see sedation, nausea, vomiting, um, cough, depression, which can be a problem, especially for older animals in the post-op period. Cough, depression from opioids can lead to them getting aspiration pneumonia. That's a big reason why people and dogs don't get out of the hospital. Um, but hyperalgesia and effects on the immune system are also seen um, with long-term use. So just keep in mind that these are not benign drugs. All these other agents are also analgesic, and we're using them in every patient for the most part. So ketamine, alpha 2s, local anesthetics, that's not like a broken record. NSAIDs and gabapentin, they're all analgesic. So for ketamine, the mechanism of action is it's an NMDA antagonist. It provides excellent somatic analgesia. It kind of depends what article you pick up, whether they say it has visceral analgesia or not. We're pretty much using it on every surgical case at Tufts. Everybody who has surgery, unless they've really got some strange neurologic condition, is getting a ketamine CRI. There's lots of really exciting research looking at other beneficial effects of ketamine. So it has um, good effects on wound healing, good effects on um, like sort of 
uh, anti-inflammatories, anti-sepsis. There's a couple of really cool sepsis models. They actually used pyometra as a model for sepsis and finding decrease in the inflammatory mediators if a dose of ketamine is given. We're doing a study right now where dogs with GDV are getting um, a bolus dose of ketamine and then they're measuring um, markers of systemic inflammation. So stay tuned for that. It's also relatively inexpensive, especially if you give it as a CRI. Um, and I have that priced out in some of the cases as we go along. Your alpha-2 agonist, most of us are using this commonly for sedation. Remember, those receptors are everywhere. The opioid receptors are throughout the central nervous system and periphery, so it's also giving you some analgesia. So really, really important component for us as part of a multimodal protocol. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit now about the local anesthetics. These are really cool drugs. Um, there are multiple ways that they can be given, multiple routes. Um, I've always said they're relatively inexpensive. They're among the least expensive things that we use. Um, there's some novel routes you can consider. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about wound soaker catheters, which are a good option for non-spay neuter surgery in a community medicine environment because they're very can be done very inexpensively. There's also a lidocaine patch. So I've talked about this last year. So if you were here last year, sorry, because you're going to cure this again. But this year, I updated the cost. So at Tufts, a lidocaine patch is $14. So that's relatively inexpensive if you can get it to stay on the dog. The new thing that's really a game changer for us in the teaching hospital, which is not inexpensive, is Noceta. So this is the liposome encapsulated bupivacaine. So that is $280 for a, for a bottle, and we usually charge each case a bottle. So this is not for us at the moment, not going to help us on our budget. However, I think it's going to come into our world eventually. So um, we'll, as I have a couple of cases where I priced out. And you'll see that on a couple of the cases, you're getting up to $50 to $70 per case. So if you can split that bottle between four cases, it may be that it's coming out cost of, of, um, equivalent to the other protocols you've been using. And if this is done well, you don't need any other analgesics. They have complete analgesia for 72 hours. Um, it's labeled for dogs having TPLO surgery. So again, not, not too often in our world. And cats um, for declaw. We should have booze booze for the declaw. Um, I guess if you are getting declawed, I want you to have Noceta because it provides really, really good analgesia. Um, but we're doing a study at Tufts with our spay dogs where we're comparing Noceta to traditional bupivacaine doses this, this, um, this fall. My resident um, in anesthesia has a big interest in community medicine, so she's doing this. And we're going to enroll every single junior spay dog, and then she's going to pain score them and see how it goes. And it was like $5,000 to buy the Noceta for all the junior spay dogs. So we're getting to the point where if this cost comes down, even if it comes down in half, it's going to be something we're going to be able to afford because you're not going to have to buy that buprenorphine. So if we can prove that it doesn't, they don't require buprenorphine, that's all the doses post-op they won't need. Yes? Yeah, so with the Noceta, it's not exactly the same as a traditional like line block. If you read the way it's described by the manufacturer and Artana, and um, uh, they're actually really great about helping you troubleshoot, you have to put it in all the layers of the closure. So you put it as deep as you feel comfortable and then kind of instill it in the different layers as you go out. And we've definitely, so our surgeons in the teaching hospital put it in everything. Everything they cut gets Noceta and every species too. Um, what we do notice is that depending on the surgeon and their technique, it kind of affects your results. So the ones that do it properly and carefully in all the layers, you really don't need any other analgesics, but the ones that are kind of in a rush, it's not as good. So um, so for local blocks, we have studies now that show that local blocks improve the analgesia for spay-neuter. And we have that in the pain management guidelines for spay-neuter. Um, we say that they're important. And the pain management guidelines from AHA say that they should be incorporated into every surgical procedure um, unless contraindicated. They're cheap. Talk a little bit more about the lidocaine patch. So these are 5% lidocaine. They're approved for neuropathic pain in people. And so they, they treat symptoms like aching, burning, sharp dabbing, and they, affect, they help patients with hyperpathia. So they're originally used a lot in patients that have herpes, neuralgic pain. Um, 
And they're cool because you can cut them. So you can cut them up, not like a fentanyl patch, and make it to fit the size of your patient. You can also put it right across the incision. Um, really interesting mechanism of action, so it's topical. They don't, they don't get absorbed into the systemic circulation. Um, the lidocaine then binds the membrane receptors topically, and they stabilize the sodium channels, which sort of decreases the reactivity and decreases the pain signals. Um, so they don't provide an anesthesia, so the area is not numb. They just have analgesia. Um, Jeff Coe's done a bunch of studies looking to see that depending on how many you put on your patient is what you get for blood levels, but they're very, very low, well below anything um, uh, uh, approaching a toxic dose. Um, you do have very high concentrations of lidocaine at the skin surface, so you have to worry about like them licking, and certainly if they eat the patch, they can get toxicity. So that's the biggest problem is that they don't, well, the biggest problem is they don't stick well to doggies, and the second biggest problem is you have to make sure they don't eat them. So this is a picture um, of a dog with a forelimb amputation, and um, this dog's whole incision has been covered with lidocaine patches. So this year I was like, all right, what does that cost? So I'm not really sure, it's not my case, but I counted up, I think it's about five patches. So at Tufts, that would be about $70. So that's you know up there, but for a big surgery on our Wattweiler, that's two doses of buprenorphine at Tufts as well. So it's fairly cost effective, um, and for that incisional paint, if you can get them to stick. Question. Yes? When you're saying cost $70, is that cost to buy the cups or cost that you're going to the It costs $14 to get it, for me to get it from my pharmacy. So they'll add like a $5 dispensing fee on top of that, depending on how they mark it up. Yeah. I had a friend who bought some for herself, and I think it cost her like $200 for a box. So it might depend on what insurance company that you, that you use. Um, we are using more of the wound soaker catheters, which I'll talk about with the case example, but this is a case from Tufts at Tech where students took the leg off, students put in a wound soaker catheter, and that's the dog at home the night of surgery. Um, so what these are is a, is a catheter that you can place directly into this um, surgical bed and it allows you to continually infuse local anesthetic or we'll often do intermittent bupivacaine if they're going home. We put these in everything, um, goats, camels, dogs, and cats, um, and we use them in all kinds of surgeries. My saddest thing about the Noceta is that we're really not using these much anymore in the teaching hospital, and so I'm worried that my students are going to forget about them when they get out into the real world where they can't afford Noceta. Yes? Yeah. Awesome. So he found a box of 30 for $60. So you can see in the real world, things are often cheaper. Um, but um, depending if you're, especially if you're not going through an insurance company. So just to give you an idea. Um, these can be purchased, so Mila sells these, or you can make your own very inexpensively. So this is just how you would make it from a red rubber catheter. So um, what we do is we use the hemostats and a lighter. It's harder and harder to find a lighter these days, but you get a lighter, you heat the tips of your um, hemostat to melt the rubber and seal the end. And then you use a tiny needle, like a 27 gauge needle, to put holes. You want to put the holes about a centimeter apart, and you need to have holes the entire length that's going to be in the incision, but not sticking out. You got to have all the holes well under the skin or your patient will get wet. Um, and your surgeon will get angry. Um, this is a little cap that we put on. It's usually we use like a Christmas tree so that we can hook it up to an infusion or you can just put an injection cap and then administer. So we do this all sterilely in the OR and hand it to the surgeon. But it's also only about $25 to purchase one of these from um, a pre-made one. Okay, so for post-operative analgesia, what we need to think about is how long is the drug gonna last? Um, what's the level of pain that we're expecting in our patient? What's the environment our patient is going back to? Um, you know, is there someone who can monitor them and administer the drugs and at what interval? Um, and then what route of administration do we want? And then cost, I kind of have there again is like, do we really want to think about the cost? I guess as long as we make sure that the patient has good analgesia, it's probably okay that we want to be cost effective within that. 
and there's tons of options. So when we look at the agents, again, the opioids are shorter acting. We already talked about wanting to minimize the use. A lot of us are working in settings where we don't really want to send opioids out into the community, so that's not really um, our best option. Same for ketamine, it's injectable, short acting, not something we can send them home on. Same with alpha 2. So really, we're gonna be focusing quite a lot on NSAIDs when we're talking about things that we can send. Hmm. Come on, guy. Home. Um, and then gabapentin, a lot of us are using this. I think the shelter medicine people were way ahead of the regular people in using this. Like everybody, every cat gets GABA when it arrives um, because you know your exams go better and everybody's happier. The issue is while we sort of believe it's analgesic and we have some great anecdotal evidence, there's not a lot of great um, controlled studies to provide evidence for the, their use in um, acute pain um, in animals yet. Um, so for the injectable NSAIDs, just looking at the cost, um, carprofen is labeled for 12 weeks and up in dogs only. Um, the injectable is about a dollar per mil. The Rimadil is about six dollars per mil. I couldn't get a price on Onsior, although probably my guy in the back will have a price for you shortly. Um, dogs and cats over four months. Um, for Meloxicam, um, it's about six um, almost $7 a mil, and then for the Medicam itself, it was um, almost $10. This is labeled for dogs six months and up, and then a single dose in cats. The big controversy here is when do you give it? So a lot of clinics give it um, with the pre-med, which is certainly better um, from a um, preventative analgesia standpoint. This is our major agent for the post-operative period, so the sooner we get it on board, the sooner it's working. I'm a little risk averse, I'm kind of a wuss. So we give it in my clinic in recovery. Um, the reason is for that is that if there were something that were to happen that would make us not want to give it, like the animal regurges or the blood pressure isn't awesome, which can happen sometimes things with students take longer than you think that they might, um, we might choose not to use the NSAID. So, but from an analgesic standpoint, the sooner you get it on board, the better. So for the oral NSAIDs, carprofen, you can find at 30 to 45 cents per tablet. Um, the Meloxicam liquid, which right now is for dogs only, is six, almost seven dollars per mil. Um, and then for, for the Onsure, we have tablets for both dogs and cats. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Galaprant um, under chronic pain. It's not a drug that we're gonna see often in the spay neuter or acute pain setting. And we don't, um, we don't often send oral NSAIDs home in spay neuter. Um, how many people do send oral NSAIDs home? So about 50-50. We definitely do on our, our student ones and um, we, we tend to do it more for dogs and for cats. So this is just to remind you of kind of the mechanism of action of these. So remember, these are the um, COX inhibitors, and they have lots of constitutive functions in the body. We'll see if he was able to make this work. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're back. Um, so lots of um, side effects from their constitutive effects in the body. So we have to be really cautious. So I love to quiz my students on the five contraindications for NSAID use. Um, they usually get three, right? And then I get disappointed. But um, so kidney function is a big one. So prostaglandins are really, really important for renal perfusion. That's why we have concerns about using these in the young animals. That's why we have concerns if the animal is hypotensive or fluid um, underloaded. There is some pretty good data that these drugs can still be um, used safely in patients, even in cases of hypotension. But then we all know about those one case of that one that that thing happened. So I think it's very um, wise to be prudent, especially if you don't know that patient's history. You don't know when he is going to eat or drink. Really, really important never to give an NSAID to a dehydrated patient. That's the number one way you can get into trouble. Um, because they're heavily metabolized, um, if there's any sort of liver dysfunction, they're contraindicated. Any kind of GI toxicities can be um, worsened if your liver's not working well. And then we know that sometimes you have idiosyncratic reactions and weird things happen. Um, because of the important role of prostaglandins in the gut, GI side effects are really important. Huge numbers of humans are hospitalized and even die from complications from their NSAID. So it's just really important to keep that in mind, especially if you're looking at giving it in the chronically administered setting. 
Um, we also know they affect clotting function. That's why you have to go off all your NSAIDs if you're going to go have surgery um, yourself. So they all affect the platelet. So effects are probably not super clinically relevant in a healthy patient, which is most of our spay neuters, but in an unhealthy patient, you can get into trouble. So if you're doing a big surgery, like my surgeon recently started playing around with tikas um, because we have so many shelter cats that need tikas. Those cats, I'm going to be a lot more conservative with an NSAID just because of the bleeding at surgery. So for cats, there are many few NSAIDs that are licensed for them. We have the Onsior and the Meloxicam. Cats are just bad at metabolizing things. So we want to lower our doses, and we don't want to give them as often. Um, if you have any concerns about renal function, then we don't want to pick these. And we do have nice consensus guidelines now on NSAID use in the cat from the AAFP. And then I always get questions about the big black box, which is super scary. We don't like having black boxes on things. So this is, remember, the Meloxicam is labeled for a single perioperative dose for the cat at 0.3 mg per kg. The annoying thing about that is that most of us feel that dose is way, way, way too high, and we would never use that dose. Our standard dose at Tufts for cats is 0.1 mg per kg. Um, oral dosing is not approved. Most of us have been using um, liquid Meloxicam orally in cats for years and years, and I still do, but I pick my cases really carefully, and I make sure my cat is hydrated, and I make sure I have informed consent, which may or may not be possible in our setting. But that's all the warning. This is the black box. So repeat use has been associated with acute renal failure and death. Do not administer beyond the initial dose. So super scary. Um, the Onsior is now available in the tablet and the injectable. These are kind of cool because they're bioequivalent. So the protocol for cats um, is that it's for three days. I understand that in Australia and Canada, it's very common to use this drug longer, and they give them a, like a holiday, and then they start it up again. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when we get into the chronic pain section. But your three days, it can be either the injectable or the tablet. Um, so gabapentin, initially this drug was really popular for neuropathic pain. It's increasingly popular for all things related to dogs and cats, but um, acute and chronic pain, it's been shown to um, decrease opioid consumption and improve patient comfort in people. Um, and we're seeing a lot, a lot of use of this. So it's kind of interesting. It's called gabapentin, but it does not work at the GABA receptor. So it's one of those things that just messes you up on the test. Um, they think maybe it works via calcium channels and decreasing neuron excitability. Um, and it has other, it probably has other central nervous system effects because of all the things it does. Definitely can reduce allodynia, which is where a non-painful stimuli becomes painful. Think about where you have like a sunburn or something and then somebody touches you. That's allodynia. Um, it's effective in cases which are not clearly neuropathic in origin. And neuropathic pain is, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but it's super confusing. Um, but what really is neuropathic pain is probably a component of all pain, which is kind of like, duh, like pain is from the nervous system. So injury of the nervous system is pain. So like, I don't know why it took us so long to sort of start talking that way. Um, but or that gabapentin has other mechanisms of impact. Um, so basically, not a ton of really good literature, but tons of anecdotes anecdotal use, and most veterinarians are pretty comfortable with this drug. And, um, you know, the worst thing I've ever heard is the dogs are ataxic or super sleepy, and if you back off on the dose, they adjust. So we've, we've used this now for 10 years, and we haven't had any tragics that I'm aware of. Um, like I mentioned, few veterinary studies. We have the 100 and 300 milligram capsules. Some people have um, tablets. There is a liquid that's commercially available. It does have xylitol, so you shouldn't use that for dogs. Um, it's fine for cats, though, as far as I know. Um, usually we start at 5 to 10 mg per kg, so similar to what we're doing for the sedation, um, and you can increase that up quite a bit if needed. Be very cautious, especially with those older pets. If you go on the higher end of the dose, they will. Um, sometimes people start worrying that their um, orthopedic disease is, is grossly worsening, and it's just because they're overdosed on gabapentin. If you back off on the GABA, they'll start walking better. Um, that's, that can be life-threatening, so that's really important. People don't like their dog not to get up. Um, side effects can be drowsiness, fatigue, weight gain in people. Um, it is metabolized by the liver in the dog, so you want to be a little bit cautious and dose reduce if you have an older dog with liver or kidney dysfunction. 
So for us, it's again relatively inexpensive. There's relatively few side effects of concern. You can also get this from a human pharmacy. So if you're working in the community, it's something that's probably available to you. Um, and we all are using this kind of as hit the door sedation, a tough we call it chill, because we give that with melatonin and acepromazine. But I think a lot of people are using this now. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some cases. Um, and these are just, Things I put together to demonstrate to you that good pain management doesn't have to be expensive, and I've included some spay neuter and some non spay neuter cases. Um, and I'm not saying that like this is the protocol you have to use. I just made up a protocol that's fine and um, and looked at how much it would cost. So the first case is Pixie Sparkle. She was a four month old Sheltie puppy. She's a little bit of a VIP because she happens to belong to my daughter. Um, she was about eight kilos when she came into the spay uh, neuter clinic to be spayed. So she got pre-medication with hydromorphone at 0.1 mg per kg with acepromazine. So I only priced out the analgesics for these cases. So her hydromorphone cost us 70 cents. She got a propofol induction because we were lazy and didn't feel like using ketamine. And I don't love ketamine in Shelties anyways. Like, they're sort of defective as far as metabolizing things. So propofol is kind of my go-to for them. Um, she got a lidocaine block with um, lidocaine at two mg per kg, which cost four cents. And then she got carprofen sub-Q, which was $1.95. Her spay took 15 minutes. Um, her surgeon said it was kind of hard because she was a bit, she, was, she must have been older than four months because she, she said she was almost going into heat. So they gave me um, carprofen at 12.5 milligrams, which would have been 90 cents for three days, but the owner was not very compliant and didn't give the tablets because she didn't have any pain. <laughs> she was running around, no e-collar, no pain. Um, so she pretty much just had the injectable stuff. So the total cost of Prixie Sparkle's analgesic plan, $3.59. Um, so here's a cat. So Banjo is sort of a typical 14-week-old male kitty cat coming in for a neuter. Um, he had ketamine, dexmedetomine, and buprenorphine, which is the mix that we use in my clinic. So we use that both for our anesthesia induction and our analgesia. I priced it out for him at his weight is about $2.50. He had a testicular block with lidocaine, one cent. Um, he had probably meloxicam. Um, now this is off label. So remember meloxicam is labeled for six months. I know many people feel pretty comfortable with a single dose in a kitten, but that's a clinic by clinic, veterinarian by veterinarian decision. You need to be aware that it's off label. Um, and Onsior is labeled um, for four months, so that's what we tend to use in my clinic because it's a little bit labeled um, earlier. And again, that's because it hasn't been studied in animals less than six months, and we know that theoretically the risk of harming their developing kidneys is higher, but there isn't any evidence that it's harmful to specifically give them to three months or four months old kittens and puppies. So you just have to use your best judgment and recognize that it's off-label use. So total cost for a balanced protocol for Banjo, three bucks. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some non neuter surgeries. When you're doing this, you wanna think about if additional analgesia is needed. So for most um, spay neuter surgeons who then do something else, they're not gonna be as proficient as they are with spay neuter. So tissue handling and degree of trauma, size of incision, or um, timing, all that is gonna be different. We wanna use a really preventative protocol. That's where Academy and our lidocaine come in handy. We wanna do local blocks. We wanna figure out what local block we can do for the area of interest. An NSAID if the patient is a good candidate. And then thinking about the longer acting buprenorphine, maybe something like a fentanyl patch, depending on where it's going, um, possibly a tramitol, although it's not our favorite for um, whether or not it works. So Tasha was a little Shih Tzu. She's pre-medded here, she's not dead. Um, seven kilo Shih Tzu coming in for a cherry eye surgery. She got hydromorphone, acepromazine, and glycopyrrolate. Again, I only priced out the hydromorphone, but for our clinic, that was 61 cents. Induction with propofol because she's squishy-faced. Squishy faced. Um, maintained with isoflurane, and then she got meloxicam um, at a cost of $1.35. Um, and she got a lidocaine and ketamine CRI, which cost $1.20. And I'll talk about how we do that later on. Um, so the total cost of the analgesics for the cherry eye was $3.61, just for what we did in the clinic, not for what she probably went home on oral meloxicam. 
So this is the dose, this is in the notes, so you can get this for how we do the LKCRI. So the dose of lidocaine is 50 mics per kick per minute, which is the same as most people's starting dose for antiarrhythmics. Um, the ketamine, the range is 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 mgs per kg per hour. We usually dose it at 0 0.6. So this chart has morphine in it. I'll tell you, we never use the morphine anymore, at least I don't. But it's showing you how much to add to the bag in order to run it at 5 mgs per kg per hour. So we don't have fluid pumps in our clinic. Actually, we do now because I found some in a warehouse and stole them. But most of the time, we don't use fluid pumps. We just calculate the drips. So you just put this amount into the bag, and then you calculate the drip rate to be 5 mils per kg um, per hour. So the last case that I think I have um, for this part is um, a limb amputation. So this was Sam. He was a young adult cat, uh, about five and a half kilos, um, coming in with some kind of chronic leg injury. And we all know that three-legged cats are more adoptable than four-legged cats. So why don't we just take the leg off? Um, and the students get to do it, so everyone is happy. Um, so we give him hydromorphone at 0.1 mg per kg, which was 47 cents for him, with dexmedetomidine at six mics per kg, which I forgot to um, price, but it's obviously not a huge volume for him. Um, he got ketamine midazolam, so that was 42 cents for his induction, and then he had a ketamine CRI. Remember, cats are not dogs. They don't metabolize lidocaine, so never, ever, 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 ever give LK to a cat. Just ketamine for the cats, please. Um, so 13 cents for his ketamine CRI, um, and you can use 0 0.3 mg per kg per hour or 0 0.6 mg per kg per hour, and usually we just put some little bit of ketamine into his fluids that he's getting. And he got a wound soaker catheter. For him, he got bupivacaine at a pretty conservative dose because cats are very sensitive to locals. So we did 1.5 mgs per kg every four hours for two days. So that cost of that, was, not counting the catheter itself, um, was $4.67. So, and the biggest problem I've had putting these in cats is that the cats feel great and they're like running around and they pull out the catheter. Um, so it's pretty hard to keep the wound soaker in the happy cat. But I think that it's mostly a preventative effect. So if you can get a few doses on board in the first 12 to 24 hours after surgery, that really, really helps the cat um, recover. Um, he got a single injection of meloxicam, um, which was a dollar. And then um, we kept him on buprenorphine at the 0 0.02 mg per kg dose um, every eight hours. And that was about $20 a day. So that was really the, the expensive part for him. Um, but in your world, it's probably $5 a day. So in the ivory tower, we do a lot of, of amputations. And um, this dog has a wound soaker, but usually nowadays they're getting um, no CEDA. Um, but again, the benefit of these other techniques is this is a dog the same day as surgery. So he's just getting up and going out for a walk, which means he's um, using other, less other drugs. He's going to be eating sooner. He's going to go home sooner, which is going to make the whole thing cheaper. So that's the other thing you have to think about is that the cost of doing good pain management at the time is going to pay you back um, in terms of less time that you have to manage them as an inpatient. And this is Keiko, the same dog that I showed you before. That's him at home in Massachusetts the day he had his leg cut off by a student. And see how much he loves his student who did his surgery. All right, so this is actually the halfway point of the talk. So I'm going to do chronic pain for the next hour, which worked out perfectly. Um, so I have seven minutes for questions. Yes. Yep. Sure. That is um, a question that I get asked every day, and there isn't consensus, even within my colleagues. So we have four anesthesiologists at Tufts, and three of us do it differently among ourselves. So I think that's why you guys can't agree, because you're all probably trained by different anesthesiologists who didn't agree. So I hate being wrong. So I looked it up in the human literature, and I found evidence for all the approaches. So my opinion, which is just my opinion, and my own colleagues who I love dearly disagree with me, I most of the time will do the mix because I like the 
initial quick onset of the lidocaine because that's helping me for surgery. And then I like having the duration of action um, longer with the bupivacaine. What the critics of that approach will say is that all you're doing is shortening the duration of action of your bupivacaine. So if you just do bupivacaine, you could potentially get up to six hours if you use an appropriate dose and you infiltrate properly. So that's kind of your pro and con. So I somewhat will, and, and I try to explain that to the students, but it's a complicated concept for a student to grasp when they're just trying to figure out like how to hold the syringe. Um, <laughs> So I think that's why they don't retain it, because it's just too much. But so what I tend to do is, it depends what you're doing it for. So if you're really doing it for the post-operative period, you should probably go with bupivacaine and make sure the number one reason a block will fail is not using an adequate volume. The other handy thing about bupivacaine is that it's only five mg per mil. So you get way more volume to play with than you do lidocaine. So sometimes if you just do straight bupivacaine, you can do a better block. Sometimes if I was gonna do lidocaine, I'll throw in some bupivacaine just to increase the volume. From a preventative analgesia standpoint, there are many cases where lidocaine is probably fine because you have the anesthesia and the analgesia at the time of the tissue injury and you're gonna decrease those transi transition mechanisms. So even though it's worn off by the end of surgery, you're still having that effect. Does that make sense? So my doses, I for cats, I never go above, so for, for anything in a cat, I never go above two mg per kg. So for cats, it'll be 1.5 to two mg per kg for bupivacaine, and about that for lidocaine. For dogs, for bupivacaine, I never go above two mg per kg. For lidocaine in a dog, you can go up to seven mg per kg. So what I usually do is pick something in that zone. I usually start with two because I'm kind of, I have a lot in my mind, so two is a number I can remember. So I usually do two and two, and then I see what kind of volume I get, and then I adjust it. A lot of times you'll find out that's way more than you need for your block, and you can go down. And your safety increases if you stay below those doses. The other thing is you can use 1% lidocaine or 2.5% bupivacaine by doubling the volume with saline. So if you're worried that you're, oh, it's a cat and I'm already at half a mil and it's making me anxious, just add in a half a mil of saline and it's the same local but you have more volume and it will go farther. So it, the nice thing about local blocks is it's really not rocket science. I mean, in people it is because they're using ultrasound and they're finding like the precise nerve and they're injecting it and um, they actually do that here at Cornell. They're like world leaders of nerve blocks in dogs. But for most of the stuff that we're doing, it's just kind of knowing your anatomy and putting the local in the area of the nerve and it's going to do something. So you can't really screw it up as long as you don't put it IV. Yeah. Sure. Yep. And you're doing, you know, 20 cat meters or 20 dog meters. How long before you do the surgery? Because yeah. I'm like sitting there like, okay, get the surgery in, but, you know, they're waiting for the block to. What I think, what I've seen work the best is have the techs do it when they're prepping. And that's fine. And then you're not waiting, and it'll. I have um, a problem on my wrist with ganglion cysts. And so I, and I hate, I'm phobic of anesthesia. Like, I will not have general anesthesia. So I have my cyst drawn, yeah, I know, irony. I know too much. I have my cyst drain under a local anesthetic. So I go in there, I give them my wrist, they put the needle in, it's like, ow. They inject the local, ow, oh, done. That's how long it takes, lidocaine. You know this, you go to the dentist, they put the needle in. I don't know why we have all this voodoo magic about it's 20 minutes. It's not 20 minutes. Have you sat at the dentist for 20 minutes? Like, no, they start drilling and then you're like, you know, maybe then they touch it up a bit, but it's, you know, it's minutes. It's not 20 minutes. Okay, but then as far as first Yeah. Uh, pros and cons, pros and cons. So if you want preventative, you gotta do it before, but my surgeons get annoyed because then you cut and it bleeds because it is a vasodilator. So I tend to do it after because it's much less pesky for the surgeons and bleeding and swelling is also painful. So you know you have to find what works with your flow and that doesn't slow you down, doesn't mess you up. So you have your things you like in a certain way, those things are valid and you shouldn't let everyone like get on you about those things. If it works for you and the patient is comfortable, then I would do it that way. 
I mean, we do for pivot cane because with the spades, I feel like having it carry into the post-operative period and the incision is helpful. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with this study where we have the straight up pivot cane technique compared to the noceta. I think we're going to get better results because the technician is going to do all of the blocks because the doctor has to be blinded. So she's going to do them the same way. So I'm sure her technique is going to be better. But it'll be interesting to see how those dogs with the straight up pivot cane, how they pain score um, compared to the noceta ones. Next to you, I think, was next. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, I want, I'd love to do that study, like, where you, because there is, with the SDMA and some of these newer tests, like, I, I'm like, we don't actually know animals 14 years later why. You know, so I think that when you can be prudent and conservative, that we should be. There are some studies where they measured renal perfusion and they took, they did like under periods of hypotension and then they gave varying NSAIDs and they showed adequate renal perfusion in those studies. There's a lot of literature around that. And I think that's what gives people the confidence with the single dose. So, but we all know like horror stories from a single dose too. So that's why I'm a little more comfortable with the ONCR because at least they're saying that they tested it down to four months. Um, and you know, if you can let them get to that age anyways. So yeah, I think that's tough. I think that's a really, really hard question and I don't think that we know the right answer. Yeah, we have to do our break. We'll start back at 945.